It's good to be together this morning. Uh, that was just a quick recap of what we were able to do together on last week. Uh, I cannot say thank you enough for all the ways in which you sacrifice to invest in others. Um, we were able to serve for at least, uh, we prepared to serve about 260 individuals, uh, 70 families were able to sponsor their Christmas, provide meals, um, and that is as a result, direct result of your generosity. Uh, so thank you so much, Midtown Bridge. Together we were able to raise about $7,245 towards the Hope for Christmas initiative. And uh, we were able to be generous and be a blessing to others with those resources and other resources as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you for about 65 or so volunteers who showed up on last Sunday. Sunday morning to help kind of accommodate um, and serve those families. And so we did that. And so praise God for a family that is truly pursuing the mission of Jesus together. And so thank you for allowing us to come together and be a beacon of light uh, to our city, to the community. Um, and literally, your generosity is reaching around the world. So thank you, Midtown Bridge, for that. Just want you all to see a few kind of snippets from what we were able to do together, whether it was uh, so many ways you all served, from uh, planning the event to uh, purchasing gifts to wrapping gifts. Uh, that was a lot of gifts, as you all could tell. U-Haul, U-Haul full of gifts, but also a U-Haul full of uh, boxes, food boxes as well. Uh, we were able to give away and be a blessing to others. Uh, checking in, taking pictures, providing snacks, teaching children, leading worship, carrying food boxes, and the list goes on and on and on. And that is a picture of what the church is. The church is not a building. The church is the people of God. And when we get on mission together about our Father's business, it is amazing what we're able to accomplish together. Well, hey, we are in week three um, of our Advent series. We're looking at Christmas, uh, the gift of hope. And so today I want to call our attention to John chapter number one, the gospel of John chapter number one. We're going to look at verses one through five and then jump down to verse 14 of the gospel of John. But let me pray over our time together as we dive into God's word. Our Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. God, thank you for this privilege we get to gather as your people. Uh, near and far, we thank you for those who are here in this room. We also pray even now for those who are online who circumstances will not allow them to make it. We pray, God, that you will move in each of our situations in a profound, glorious, precious, and special way. Thank you that you are the God who comes close. So now, God, I pray that your word will grip our hearts afresh, that we will marvel at the profound beauty of the Christmas story. Our hearts will be enlivened and challenged and shaped by the beauty of what you have done, by the beauty of what you're doing, but also by the beauty of the promises of the things you will do. So, God, I pray that you will speak, you will whisper, you will yell, whatever you need to do to get our undivided attention. Help us to hear your voice. And now, oh God, would you hide me behind the cross that the words I share might not be of Milton, There'll be words that uh, you've given me to share with your people. We trust you, God, to allow your word to return back to you and accomplish the very things you've sent it out to accomplish. We love you and we trust you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray and all that agree said, amen. Uh, today, I'd like to speak as we interrogate this text on the whole thought of marvel. Marvel. Um, marvel, it simply means to be filled with wonder. And I'll be honest, if we're honest with ourselves, it's very easy um, to be so um, familiar with the Christmas story that in some ways it may have lost its wonder. We no longer marvel at the beauty and the, the wonder and the splendor of the Christmas story. If you've been in the Christian faith perhaps more than a couple years, it is so easy to just say, man, to tr become casual towards Christmas. And so my prayer for us as we look at the Christmas story is that, man, God will cause us to marvel afresh today. Because this story, this, this reality, this truth, it changes everything about everything. And so today as we look at the words written by John, I pray that our hearts will be gripped afresh at the miraculous move of God in the Christmas story. Hear these words written by John, John chapter number one. You'll find it on the screen above me. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him 
and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jumping down to verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, they write the Christmas story from Earth's perspective. They share how we know the story of how Joseph and Mary, they're now ushered down to Bethlehem in fulfillment of prophecy to give birth to the Messiah, the Christ child. In the midst of inconvenience, in the midst of chaos, we see this beautiful narrative unfolding. That is Matthew and Luke's perspective of the Christmas story. But John, he says, I want to approach the Christmas story from a different angle. You you have what was happening in the human realm, but now let me introduce you what was happening from the heavens realm. You've seen what it looked like for from the earthly perspective. Now let me show you what was happening from the eternal perspective. And thus John, he puts pen to paper to write from heaven's perspective of the Christmas story. He gives us a beautiful reminder of what was happening in the cosmos when we look at Christmas. John Chapter 1, it tells us of what really happened 2,000 years ago, but also what it means for us today. You see, John, he wants to talk about the celebrity of the universe. And what better way than to lay out his accomplishments and his resume? There are three truths that should cause us to marvel at the Christmas story this morning that we see outlined in these passages that I just read before us. There's three truths that I pray will grip our hearts that will cause us to be enlivened afresh again at the hope and beauty of the Christmas story. The first one we see in verse 1 through 3 is Christmas is the most underestimated story. Christmas is the most underestimated story. Back to the text, John, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that he that has come into being. In essence, what John says, he's look, before we can fully understand the gravitas of, of, of the Messiah and what, who he is, we must understand his origin. He has none. He just always was. In the beginning, if you go back to the beginning, he was already there before it happened. He is the is that always was. He said, before you can fully understand what happened in Bethlehem, you need to understand what was happening uh, before Bethlehem came to be. He was already there. He says, in the beginning was the word. In other words, the one who spoke. And the galaxies whirled into place. Stars burnt in the heavens and planets began to orbit their suns. Eternal, infinite, unlimited power. Yet, he came in the flesh to a speck in the universe called Earth. You see, the Christmas story from heaven's perspective should cause us to marvel because Christmas reminds us it is the, it is the most underestimated story of all times. John says, I want you to understand this. I, I'll be honest. Um, I don't know a lot about science. I really don't. I really don't know a lot about science. I wish I knew more. Uh, but, the, but the little I do know and the more I do learn about science, it really just kind of blows my mind when you think about just really putting science and you layering that with the Christmas story. It really just kind of, I mean, it's like one of those kind of your head explodes on the inside, then explodes again. It's, it's one of those moments if you could really wrap your, your head around it. There's so much I don't understand. I, like, for example, some of you, you know, for the science, I know people, you know, like the earth is about, it vacillates anywhere from about nine. 91 and some to 93 million uh, miles away from the sun. And, and there's this whole kind of this whole kind of lifespan kind of uh, paradigm or as, as far as where if we was a little too close to the sun or 
a little too much further from the sun, then life could not exist as it was. But yet God in his providence, um, he allowed us to just be able to inhabit this terrestrial ball called Earth to be this significant distance away from the sun so life can exist. And that's interesting. But also what I found interesting was um, just the known galaxy. And we know it still is expanding as science would teach us. Um, it still is expanding. But, but most would say it's about um, in diameter, about 93 billion light years. Imagine that. 93 billion light years. And it's still expanding in radius. The known galaxy. Crazy, right? Just, 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 just think about that. And the one who created all of that wrapped himself in flesh. That's the Christmas story. A lot of times it's easy to be casual with that. Like, you know, okay, well, yeah, yeah, Christmas, yeah, Jesus, baby, manger, yeah, all that. That's, that's cute. But no, when you think about like 93 billion light years and it still is expanding, that's the known universe. And we don't know how much more we don't know. I mean, science is still like we don't know. It's, some say, man, if we was to really try to figure it, it's probably like 250 times larger than that. We don't really know all that. We're still trying to figure all that out. And yet the one who was there who spoke that and it came into existence chose to wrap himself in flesh and dwell in human form on this little speck of a planet called Earth for a moment in time. The Christmas story, it is the most underestimated story. Because we forget how, how precious that is that God would come and dwell among us. The creator who made it all, who had all unlimited, infinite power, had all authority, and yet he submits to his creation for a season and a moment in time. Colossians chapter number one, verses 16 through 17, Paul, he writes it this way, looking back at the gospel and the beauty of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter number one, verse 16 and 17, he says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He says this, this baby that we celebrate being born in a, in a common stable among animals. He is the one who holds all things together. That is the splendor of the Christmas story. It, it is a story that reminds us that it is the most underestimated story. I, I know you're thinking, well, Milton, that sounds good. And, oh, that's okay. I'm not that impressed about that. In other words, Milton, maybe, maybe you feel like, man, well, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. And you don't understand, like, like, like tell me something to help me. Well, why does that even matter that God, who, who is above all of this, all of creation, all of the known galaxy and universe, the one who sits over all of that, and yet he will confine himself for a moment of time, wrap himself, being born in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Why, why does that matter? Well, it matters because love compelled him to do that. His love for you was so strong. It was so overwhelming that he was willing to come and dwell among us. You see, the Christmas story demonstrates that even underestimated circumstances and situations are no match for God. The Christmas story, what, what it encourages us to understand is no matter how underestimated we may feel at times, no matter how much we may feel like, man, we're being defeated by our circumstances and situations, that man, God is a God who loves to intervene in situations that seems overwhelming and underestimated. You're not forgotten. We should marvel at the Christmas story because Christmas is the most underestimated story. But secondly, we'll see that Christmas is the most underappreciated story. Christmas is the most underappreciated story. Picking up at verse 4 and 5 in the text, it says, In him was life, 
and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John says, he says, what you got to understand about when Jesus showed up on the scene, what you have to understand about is that, man, he was the epitome of life and light. He says, in other words, life as you know it would change. But the life, in essence, John is talking about, and we see this theme roaring throughout the book of John, it is the whole idea of eternal life. That's why in John 10.10, 10, he says, I came that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. In other words, I didn't come just to satisfy your earthly desires. I came to introduce you to something that is eternal, that will sustain you and fulfill you when earthly things let you down. I came that you may have life. You see, the baby born in Bethlehem was more than just a child, but he was life and light bursting on the scene. Life meaning we, read, we, we really were, we re really were needed spiritual life, and Jesus would bring us spiritually alive. It's the kind of life we have when God rules in and over our life. You see, this is not just existing, but this is trusting and living fully in our identity of who Christ and God intended us to be. A lot of times we're honest, we think we have life. And we search for life in material possessions or maybe relationship status or careers or these other things. And the problem is that those things will ultimately leave us wanting. They will leave us empty. To be honest, we sometimes don't appreciate God because we lack or have lost those things. We ask ourselves that question, God, where are you? Because this misfortune has visited me. Maybe it's material misfortune. Maybe it's loss of a job. Maybe it's loss of a loved one. And all those things, they are heavy. But in God's kindness, sometimes, in order to help us appreciate real life, he has to allow sometimes those things we try to attach our lives to to be removed. Because we're too easily oversatisfied with pretend life. Uh, my daughters, you know, they're, they're older now, but, but I remember early on, in many, many years, um, they love playing with dolls. They love playing kind of imaginative games with their dolls and toys. They'll make paper dolls. They have a whole room of songs and games and shows and, and parents and kids and all. Just, just a whole kind of experience of a doll life. They have like dolls sitting lined up. They'd make paper dolls. They'd be playing songs, uh, talent shows. And there'll be times we would have to interrupt their fun, their imaginative moment. Say, girls, it's time to come down and eat. And they push back like we're not, we're not, we're not hungry. We want to continue playing with this pretend life. But we say, girls, no, you need to stop what you're doing. Come down and eat because what we want to give you is, is substance for real life. The pretend stuff you're enjoying right now, it's not going to sustain you in this real thing called life. And so sometimes we have to in interrupt their pretend life so they can really experience and enjoy real life. <laughs> John, in this passage, he says, when that baby showed up on the scene, he was coming to introduce you and I to real life, eternal life. Abundant life. Life that cannot be satisfied and met by material possessions that will one day let you down. Life that cannot really fulfill you by those things and careers and other identity or moves we try to associate with. But no, true eternal life. John says when he came on the scene, he, 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 in him was life. And the light, life was the light of men. And as he says, look, you see, he came to bring life, but also he came to illuminate some things, to expose some things. You see, light is interesting. Atlanta, I don't know about you all, but in our neighborhood, it seems like, man, if it just the wind blows hard, our power go off. I'm like, really? It's not raining. It's just like barely windy. And we lost power. And what is going on at times? And, and I think about that, it's like, you know, but, but you know, you, you really appreciate, you really sometimes we take light for granted until we're like in a, in a storm where we're surrounded by darkness. 
That's when we start to really value light. Well, let's be honest. Light is, is really appreciated, you know, when, you know, it's really appreciated in a lot of ways. But, but I'll be honest, sometimes light can be offensive as well. Sometimes, you know, you know, you know, our daughters in school moments, you know, you know, you know, we come in, it's time to go to school, it's time to get up. And what we do is we come in and we flick on the lights. Y'all ever woke up by the lights? You know, that's that's the worst. It's like it's just it's this jolting feeling when you sleep and you're resting. All of a sudden light kind of hits you. Like, oh, come on, turn the lights off. Because light is appreciated, but also light can be offensive. John says, look, when he came on the scene, that baby in the manger that you you think was all cuddly and cute. No, no, he was coming to also bring some type of division because he was the light and he was meaning to expose those sinful, broken, wayward tendencies we all struggle with. He's the life, but also he is the light. Christmas, it is the most underappreciated story. Christmas, it is the most underestimated story. But then also I pray we'll marvel because Christmas is the perfectly orchestrated story. Christmas is the perfectly orchestrated story. Jumping down to verse 14, we touched on this um, last week. Uh, many of you all were kind of around serving. So you may not have heard, heard all of it, but it, look what he says. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, looking at the Christmas story from heaven's perspective, he says, that word I was talking about earlier, I, I, I want you to sit under this reality. I want you to rest in this tension. I want you to marvel at this beauty. That word that was there in the beginning became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, that, 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 that is profound. That is glorious. That is beautiful. That is scary. It is a mix of any type of emotion you could feel when you really think about just what that really means. The word became flesh. The Message Bible says, he moved into the neighborhood. God dwelt among us. God put skin on. The mighty creator became a part of the creation, limited by time and space, and susceptible to aging, sickness, and death. That is what the Christmas story means. It's interesting, Exodus chapter number 33, uh, in Exodus chapter number 33, I encourage you to go back and read that. And if you want to even turn to it, even now, feel free to do so. But in Exodus chapter number 33, uh, there's this entering kind of interaction between Moses and God and Israel. M M Moses is this kind of season where he's interceding on behalf of Israel. You see, we are so much like Israel. One moment, they're like, yeah, God. Next minute, they're like, man, forget you, God. You know, you're kind of back and forth, this seesaw effect. And, and God is kind of, he's pretty upset with Israel, and he's about to judge them, about to wipe them out. But Moses, he intercedes on behalf of them. And in Exodus chapter number 33, we see this kind of interaction between God and Moses. God and Moses. And, and, and Moses, like, he kind of, he's having this intimate moment with God. He says, God, you know what? Um, I, I love what's happening right here. I'm paraphrasing all all this and around 13 33 verse 18 he says man lord show me your glory that, that's what moses says to god he's having this intimate moment with god he says lord show me your glory show me thy glory and god says something interesting to moses later on in chapter number 33 after verse 18 he says moses you don't understand what you're asking for he says moses if i did that it would be poof he says you, you, you die moses he says, because no man has ever seen my face. I, I'm just that glorious. The, the, in the Hebrew context, uh, uh, certain names of God, they were not even audibly mentioned or say because they thought God was just that holy. They had such a high reverence of who God is. They, there were certain attributes, certain names. It was, like, it was like sinful to even announce it because that is how glorious, that is how mighty, that is how wise, that is how omniscient and omnipotent God is in the Hebrew context. We're removed from that now. And so we sometimes become very casual towards, towards God. But in, in Exodus 33, Moses says, God, show me thy glory. God says, Moses, I can't do that. If I showed you my glory, it would kill you, Moses. He says, but what I will do, Moses, 
is I'm going to put you in the, in the cleft of the mountain. I'm going to allow my glory to pass by. Exodus chapter number 33, don't take my word for it. Go back and read it. I'm going to allow my glory to pass by. And at a certain point, you're going to be able to turn and see the backside of my glory. John says, this glorious God became flesh and dwelt among us. This is no casual story. This is no casual interaction. This is no just, I can kind of brush this off. It is okay. Yeah, that's good for you, but I'm okay. No, no, this is it's God visiting with his creation, wrapping himself in flesh. How marvelous. Christmas is the perfectly orchestrated story. When you think about that, when you think about the ruler of the galaxy, when you think about the one who, who, who exists, exists, exists over it all, who rules over it all, and yet he moves into the neighborhood. Talk about a downsize. Uh, my, my family and I, we, we've been blessed. One of my wife's closest friends, they're very generous. Um, and, and, you know, throughout the summer, they normally allow us to go to their, their condo. They have a condo down in South Beach in Aventura, uh, Miami. It's, it's amazing, amazing, amazing. That's like our happy place. You know, you got the happy place. Like, I can just get there. That's our happy place. And I, it never fails. Normally, we'll drive down. It's going to be down there for a, a period of time. And we'll drive down the way down. We're excited. We check. We normally break up the ride and stay in a hotel. And we're like, cool, right? We go to this, 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 this condo and we, you know, we live in it. It's over overseeing the ocean. It's beautiful. It's a, probably like maybe a couple thousand square feet. It is amazing. And then we'll come back and we'll drive back and we'll, we'll stay in the hotel. On the way down, we're cool with the hotel. But on the way back, we're like, man, it's cramp. Oh, we feel so on top of each other. Because we, we just experienced all this square footage where we each got our room, got different corners. It's glorious, beautiful views, amazing. But then when we come back home, we're making our way back home. We stop in the same hotel most of the time. It was like, man, this is too small. But it wasn't too small when we left. Because something about a downsize that makes you uncomfortable. You start to realize some things. God's love for us, the Christmas story, it teaches us. Man, God was so in love with you and I that he was willing, even for a temporary moment, to downsize. He downsized so that ultimately he can lead to an upgrade. Not for himself, because he was God and he needed nothing, but for us. Don't ever become too casual with the Christmas story. Because it is the most orchestrated of all stories. <laughs> Close with this. Give me a chance to share with this. Share this with someone last week. But uh, perhaps you've heard of Father Damien. Father Damien, um, he, he, he was, a, he was a, a saint, saintly of a man. Father Damien had a, had a calling to, to go and dwell uh, with the people of uh, the kingdom of Hawaii. He felt a calling to go and minister to these people. Now, again, it wasn't just people chilling on the island, but these were people who were actually uh, confined. Um, they were confined to a specific area of an island because they had leprosy. He lived around 18, mid-1800s. And Father Damon felt called to go and serve these people who were confined to this island because they had leprosy. They, they knew that death was imminent. It was inevitable. And what Father Damien did was, for many years, he spent time just kind of bandaging their wounds. He spent time building coffins. To the point he built over 2,000 coffins, Father Damien, loving on these people. For 16 years, pouring his life out, Father Damien serving these people. He would give sermons, but then particularly on this one day, years into his ministry, this sermon, it hit kind of different. Because he opened up his sermon this way. He says, we lepers. When Father Damon got to the island, he was not a leper, but somewhere along the way, by him getting close, by him ministering to the people, he became a leper. He opened up a sermon. This particular day, he said, we lepers. And that's the saying, no longer am I here to serve you, I'm now one of you. The Christmas story, what makes it so beautiful, what makes it so profound, is that God became one of us. God wrapped himself in flesh so that you and I might have a relationship with him, so that we might experience him. 
so that we might know that he loves us completely and fully. Don't take for granted the hope and beauty of the Christmas story. And this Christmas, may it, hit, may it sit differently for you. Not because you got all the gifts you wanted, not just because, you know, family is there or friends are there or because some things are going your way. But I pray it'll sit different. It'll feel different because you and I, we marvel at the beautiful reality, Emmanuel, God with us. And that changes everything. Let's pray. Father, don't you ask of me. And Father, I pray you'll take these words. God, in your own way, your own beautiful, profound, glorious way, as you've orchestrated the story of you being born at exactly the right time. Father, we're not in this room by coincidence. You are also orchestrating our story. Let's be honest, God. For some of us, we feel like we're the bad note in the orchestra because of how our lives are going. But I thank you, God, that in every orchestra, every note is important when it's under the guidance of the conductor. So, Father, I pray that you will conduct our lives in such a way that we'll see the chaos, the madness, the, the things we wish we could change, the things we wish would not have happened. We'll see them from your perspective, that you are the great master orchestrator. And you take unimaginable circumstances and create something beautiful with them and through them. So for the brother and sister in this room or the brother and sister tuning in online, would you remind them afresh of your love for them? And God, I pray that the Christmas story will grip our hearts anew this morning. We love you. We praise you. We trust you to do what we can't do. And even sometimes those things we try to do, God, may we yield and surrender to you. So God, would you be God and help us to surrender fully and completely to you? It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. And all that agree, it's an amen. Well, hey, Shadika's going to lead us in song. And while she does that, just ask us to be in prayer and ask the Lord to show us what is the truth he have us to apply to our own life. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you need someone just to pray with you or pray for you. Hey, we'd love to pray with you. Got one of our elders, Aaron, there, and I'll also be standing as well. Maybe you just need some prayer because you're encountering some hardships, some hard times. Hey, it gives our heart such joy and delight to be able to come alongside our brothers and sisters and encourage them, but also pray with them uh, in this thing called life. Because life, it does get hard. But the good news of the Christmas story is that God has come close. And you never have to wonder if you've been forgotten or forsaken, because he is with you and he is for you completely and always.